Hey everyone, and welcome to Open Door Philosophy, a podcast where a high school philosophy teacher, that's me, and his former student who's currently studying philosophy in college, that's me, unpack a variety of big philosophical concepts in an understandable way, all towards the purpose of living a good life. Welcome to episode 14, where we'll discuss the philosophy of pragmatism and William James with special guest Jeffrey Howard. But first, before we get to that, Andrew, it's been a few weeks. How's everything in your world? It's going pretty good. I, I just realized I'm halfway through my summer break, which is a scary feeling to have, but I'm ready to get back into it, and life's been pretty good. No complaints. We always talk about the weather on these catch-ups uh, we noticed in the last episode, but it's an unfortunate time in Houston. Like much of the year, it's very uh, muggy, but I know you were just in Colorado, Mr. Parsons, so uh, how was that? It was beautiful. It's Colorado. We went on uh, many fantastic hikes, saw all the beauty that I love in the forest and then above the above the tree line in the alpine world. And uh, it was great. Uh, about the last three days, smoke moved in from surrounding wildfires in other states. So things got very hazy those last couple of days. But uh, any time in Colorado is a good time. And like you, uh, the summer is coming to a close. And here starting uh, in two days, I will be back at work full time, so, and I'm looking forward to that. So, so that's good. That's all good stuff. Hey, how'd your uh, how'd your logic class end up? It ended up pretty good. I I was kind of iffy about it, taking it, but I was really enjoying it through the end. And I think logic's really cool. I I never really thought it was that practical until I started dealing with it, and I think I wanted try to study it a little more in the future, but it's really cool. It's a really good way to think about arguments and go through their their validity and truth. And it was a fun time, so so very fun. Well you said practical and I'm gonna use that as a as a great segue to uh, move on to our main topic for today. Today we're going to discuss another philosophy of living, as we have with Stoicism and Existentialism. This time it's pragmatism, which is almost impossible to talk about with some mention of William James, the late 19th, early 20th century American philosopher and psychologist. And today we're thrilled to have with us an expert, well-versed in pragmatism to help us unpack it all, and that's Jeffrey Howard. Jeffrey Howard is the founder of Eraticus, an online publication taking a pragmatic approach to ideas. He has served as the editor-in-chief since 2016. He is also the host of Damn the Absolute, a philosophy podcast about our relationship to ideas. Jeffrey, welcome to the show. Happy to be here. I guess before we get going, we'll extend the same uh, catch-up protocol to you. How's everything in your world? Things are actually pretty wonderful. I actually just got back from visiting family. I come from a very large family, and we don't often get to have all of us together, so... When someone decides to fly out, the others, the couple of us who are not at home tend to find their way there. And it, it gets a little bit crazy. You don't get to talk too much one on one with people because you have limited time and usually big gatherings. But it's just it was good to see family. And I'm just back from that and enjoying the wonderful summer weather that is Seattle. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, has it cooled down up there, I suppose? Yeah, we survived a really quite tragic heat wave from a few weeks ago and now we're back to weather in the 70s with clear blue skies i can't imagine that's that's insane for 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 summer weather here that's that would be a a blessing yeah that's winter (laughs) weather here in houston (laughs) minus the humidity i'm sure yeah it was a record-setting time there have now been six days in Seattle that have reached above 100 degrees in the 130 years that they've been recording temperatures. And three of those six days happened during this heat wave a few weeks ago to give you a a bit of context as to how dramatic it was. Let's start off with our first good question of the episode. So can you give us a little bit of background on William James for, for those who might not be familiar with him? Yeah, I'd love to. William James is sometimes referred to as the 
father of American psychology, and in some ways, maybe a, a father of American philosophy. Uh, William James was born in 1842 to a wealthier Irish American family. He is the older brother of Henry James, who is also a very capable novelist and well-known writer throughout the world. And William James was really fortunate to have a very um, freewheeling education growing up. He was educated in Europe and sort of on the move and eventually, as we'll get to, becomes a key contributor to the philosophy that is known as pragmatism. So, Jeffrey, say, uh, say a little bit more maybe about the context that he was growing up in, like the life and times, if you will. Uh, of course, we know historically these events that people live through influence their philosophy and their thinking. Is there anything especially important about the late 19th or the mid to late 19th century? Yeah, a few things. So William James comes of age around the same time as Darwin's theory of evolution becomes popularized and you have all these debates around the the wars, if you will, or a conflict between science and religion and faith and William James wrestles with this. He's one of many people who are trying to figure out how those two fit together. And you end up having the, the continual ascendancy of the natural sciences. And people, many start to lose their ability to hold on to faith and religion. And they lean more to Darwin's theories. And now if you understand Darwin, he presents the evolution of different species adapting according to those that are best fit for their environments and they continue to evolve and although he's not very explicit about it in his book everyone reading it surmises that well that's the same thing that happens to humans which suddenly humans are no longer in this special role in the universe we are one among many species of animals and so james is wrestling with this Unlike many of his friends and even siblings during the 1860s who went and fought during the American Civil War, he did not go, which there's speculation as to why. Some say he wanted to, but because of health, couldn't. He actually had a brother who was shot and wounded during the Civil War, and he tended to him by his bedside. That's the context in which he's growing up in. You've got the Civil War. He's wrestling with questions of determinism. Does free will exist? And William James actually, he wrestles with this throughout most of his career, the question of free will and determinism. And he becomes incredibly depressed about determinism. He becomes early on, believes that we live in a determined world. And if that's so, all these, what he sees as sort of tragic consequences follow these are the ideas that he's swimming in early on in his life. So something that you mentioned earlier was William James is kind of a contributor to this American philosophy. Um, I think this is the first time that we've ever talked about an American philosopher on this podcast. So can you give us a little bit of background on what this kind of, I guess, subgenre of philosophy that American philosophy is? Yeah, there's a very prominent speech that Ralph Waldo Emerson gives that some people point to as a kicking off point for Ameri or for American philosophy. William James, his father swam in a lot of prominent intellectual circles, which included the close friendship of Ralph Waldo Emerson, the great transcendentalist, the sage of Concord. And he was actually visited William James soon after he was born. And so this is, Again, this is the context that William James is growing up in. And for him, William James describes philosophy as our more or less dumb sense of what life honestly and deeply means. It is only partly gotten from books. It is our individual way of just seeing and feeling the total push and pressure of the cosmos. And so for James, that's how he describes philosophy. So I, I want to be careful here when I say American philosophy because there are some who... There are some who want to say philosophy is this very narrow academic and technical thing. And in order to be a philosopher, you have to be a part of the quote unquote 
canon of philosophy. And someone like William James is going to broaden it out a lot more and say it's really the whole of how we respond to existence and all of us are philosophers in some sense. So all those caveats aside, it really begins with Ralph Waldo Emerson. And Ralph Waldo Emerson gives a speech, I believe in the, I want to say in the 1830s, called the American Scholar. And Ralph Waldo Emerson basically calls upon his fellow Americans to establish their own tradition that we can no longer borrow and lean on on Europe for our philosophical ideas that we really have to toil and give our own contributions. And so arguably American transcendentalism and the work of Ralph Waldo Emerson and his friends are the beginning point for American philosophy. And then from there you start to have William James and the pragmatists who built out what is usually considered the truly unique American contribution to philosophy. Yeah, I've always found it interesting. We've mentioned Emerson. We've not done an entire episode on any American philosopher, but but the first couple episodes I was reading a biography on him. So I talked about him a bit. And I do think the development of of American philosophy, I know there's some debate as to whether or not there's, you know, a particular flavor of philosophy that we might call American as opposed to European or continental. But it, it seems that you know, we have Emerson and we have Thoreau, and sometimes those guys are called philosophers. Sometimes they're called essayists. Sometimes they're called naturalists. You know, it seems with William James, we do have almost this establishment of philosophy. And then from him comes many others. Who's, who's a couple uh, couple of names we could associate with maybe around the time of, of William James or, or, or who maybe uh, came out of sort of the pragmatic American tradition with with William James. Yeah, there is a handful who come around that time. You have Charles Sanders Peirce, who William James met during his days at Harvard. You have Oliver Wendell Holmes, who's not really a philosopher. He actually be, goes on to become a Supreme Court justice, who leaves a, a long and strong legacy on our legal system in the United States. You have John Dewey, who's about a half generation separated from Charles Sanders Peirce and William James. Those three are considered the three classical pragmatists, but then you also have individuals like Jane Adams, who was a big mover in the progressive era of American politics with settlement houses. You have George Herbert Mead. And so those are a handful of the thinkers who are moving around at this time. And William James, although he is known as, the popularizer of pragmatism, he actually credits Charles Sanders Peirce with the original ideas of pragmatism, as well as coining the term pragmatism. Before we get any further on pragmatism, because I don't know, I'm just finding some interest in this topic here. Do, do you think there's anything especially unique about American philosophy? I think one of the unique aspects of American philosophy is the freshness. And this is common to a lot of things that are considered, quote unquote, American, that from a European or Eurocentric perspective, there was a newness and a freshness to America, to the United States. You had people coming from a lot of different places around Europe and eventually the world who were seeing it as a new land, a new opportunity. Obviously, you had many indigenous peoples and cultures here who have been contributing and existing for hundreds and thousands of years. But it's unique in the sense that it is willing to sweep aside tradition and established official canons. You don't have the weight and the burden of, say, the Catholic Church in Europe as you have the freshness in the United States. I think of a personal experience for me that maybe captures this. I spent a summer studying at Cambridge in England, and I remember... About two weeks in, I started to feel this growing burden on my shoulder and this rigidity. And I realized part of it for me, I think, was I felt the centuries and centuries of established tradition and ways of doing things. And granted, that's a bit more extreme in a very storied place like Cambridge. But I still felt that so fiercely that my 
sort of my American intuitions wanted to rebel against it. I wanted freshness. I wanted the open skies of Wyoming and Montana. I wanted to start anew. And so I think that's the unique thing about American philosophy is we can learn and listen to those traditions, but for the pragmatists, if we hold too strongly to tradition, it blinds us to progress and the fact that everything is always changing. I guess when I think about William James, just how I was first introduced to him, he was more of a psychologist. And that's just because I learned about him in psychology. So I don't really know when he was growing up as a young guy, maybe around my age or younger, and he was going across and studying across Europe. Was he explicitly studying philosophy or was he studying science and you know medicine? And, and then through those ideas, was, was that contributing to his future philosophical journey? So William James as a teenager was actually a painter. He was studying to be a painter and that was his goal in life. He's had a few, he had a few different careers, but as a teenager, he had made the decision, I am going to be a painter. And so that's kind of where he started. But by the time he was in his twenties and he went to Europe, he was actually leaning toward anatomy and physiology. Now, that was sort of where psychology was at the time. You have Wilhelm Wundt, who was a, a German father of psychology. But psychology at that time was more of studying, think of more like our reflexes and responses to stimulus in our environment and trying to study that in a lab. The, the early psychologists saw the successes of empiricism and the natural sciences and thought, well, let's apply those methods to the human mind and to human beings. And that's where psychology starts. Eventually, William James comes back from his time abroad in France and Berlin, and he he rubs shoulders with a bunch of eventually very prominent philosophers. And when he comes back to the States, he actually studies physiology and anatomy, goes to medical school at Harvard. Eventually... William James realizes his passion is in this budding field of psychology. He starts his own lab and eventually identifies as a philosopher. So he's very steeped in this psychological and maybe that's not the right word, but like scientific tradition. And that's, that's a big influence. Yeah, definitely. He's, he starts out as an empiricist. I mean, he identifies as an empiricist, but his philosophical upbringing in some ways is with empiricism. He's a scientist and he wants to study the human experience from a scientific lens. And that's where he sees philosophy at the time was very idealistic. You had Hegel and Kant who had been big influences coming out of Germany that were more in the the abstract realm. Whereas he thought we need to get into the the messiness of daily life and we need to deal with the facts. And so he's a psychologist and a scientist in a way that, again, he founds this new field or is one of the founding contributors to the field of psychology. A little bit of my own, maybe similar to, to yours, Andrew, my own background. I was introduced to William James in my undergrad as a psychology major. It was my psychology professors who actually introduced me to pragmatism it wasn't my philosophy professors because philosophers in a lot of departments across the united states kind of don't give pragmatism its uh, due attention from my perspective it's a bit more neglected as compared to some other traditions that's been my experience too i've i don't think we've ever talked about uh pragmatism at all or at least glanced over it yeah, I think the only time we hit it in my course is when we study the philosophy of religion and we talk about how we can verify religious experience. And, and William James wrote quite a bit about that. Actually, he spoke about it through his, uh, through his lecture in Scotland on religious experience. Oh, yeah, I'm kind of drifting here, but uh, <laughs> since we're talking about it. So there's definitely, I, I see that William James acknowledges the conflict 
between, say, the empirical sciences and human experience. And that in the late 19th century, there was a great deal of emphasis in philosophy on the natural sciences and how rationality informs how we behave. That can be linked into psychology. So certainly, and, and he and William James was involved in the sciences. So we do have this aspect of religious experience that, of course, many people are still very involved with religion in the 19th century, although some interest is beginning to wane. How does William James, as a man of science, balance these ideas that, that come from religious experience? You mentioned William James's lectures, the Gifford lectures that he gave in Edinburgh. That was, I believe, 1902 where he talks about the varieties of religious experience, the Gifford lectures, he would actually, he had been invited a couple times and he turned down. One might wonder if he just didn't feel confident enough. Cause again, as an American coming over to Europe, lecturing, how dare an American lecture Europeans about philosophy and psychology. And so he eventually gives this lecture series about the varieties of religious experience. And when he's giving it, he starts out and pays, I think he pays homage to, in some ways to Emerson of, hey, I'm just an American, don't mind me, but here, here's some ideas, right? <laughs> um, and he talks about religion not from the point of theology. He's not here to split hairs about how many angels can fit on the head of a pin. He's not here to discuss the religious history of the Catholic Church and the Protestant schism and all that stuff. He is here to talk about what does it mean to live a religious life, what does the religious life look like for a lot of different people? And James comes at it through that lens of how can we also evaluate different religious experiences? And at, at the beginning, he basically highlights how different religions work for different people with different temperaments. Some people maybe live more fruitful lives when they're religious tradition is steeped in rituals and themes or and hymns that are sung in Latin, whereas maybe someone else needs a type of religion that is going to speak of fire and brimstone. Maybe someone else needs a religion that is going to focus on compassion and be a social gospel that is oriented on caring for the poorest in our community. And he goes on and outlines all these different types of religious life and what it looks like. This might seem unrelated, but I think it's a good time to kind of delve into what pragmatism actually is. I mean, we've kind of hinted at how William James has contributed to the history of philosophy as a whole, but can let's just start off with what is pragmatism in the simplest sense? Pragmatism in the simplest sense would probably be focusing on what works for us, which is like, yeah, that makes sense. Like we care about what works. But for a pragmatist to dig a little bit more into that, the pragmatist is going to focus on the consequences of ideas as compared to what William James felt philosophy had gone in this idealistic or rationalistic route of trying to think and fit ideas about the world in this all-encompassing, totalizing framework that reflects reality. For a pragmatist, they're focused on ideas working in our experiences. And so a pragmatist is going to evaluate an idea as to if I act according to my belief in this idea and it solves problems and it helps me and my community to live well, there's a quality of truth to that idea. Pragmatism stands in contrast with, in some ways, a lot of ancient Greek philosophy, which is where a lot of philosophy classes started or begin their course, where philosophy for a long time has and continues to this day to focus on essence, to focus on what is the unchanging, universal, always eternally true nature of all things. And that view of philosophy, in order to make sense of that, arrives on this notion of essence, that there is a 
eternal essence that is maybe a chair or a table. And that's where you get into Plato and his platonic ideals that there's a, in this abstract realm, there's this perfect chair that exists and everything else we encounter in our lived experiences or experiences is sort of a shadow of that chair. The pragmatists come along and they challenge that. For example, if I'm one of these more idealist or absolutist philosophers, I'm going to try and, and I'm trying to make sense of what a knife is. I'll say, well, a knife is something that has the essence of knifeness or something like it, it participates in the essence of being a knife, which is a super weird and abstract way philosophers describe stuff that doesn't make sense to most of us common people. And they're going to try and say, well, a knife cuts and you go, well, a sword cuts. What makes a sword different from a knife? And they'll say, oh, well, uh, a knife is shorter. And someone will say, well, what if I'm someone who has shorter arms than other people? When is my knife become a sword? And you have all these debates and wrestles that are kind of abstract and maybe not that relevant. Whereas a pragmatist is going to focus on all of the practical consequences of the idea of a knife as something that cuts. So one way to view this, I think of an example of encountering a, imagine you encounter a, a wooden plane that has four wooden cylinders that are extending beneath it. For a pragmatist, they're going to understand that there's not something that's always universally true it depends on the context and what you're trying to use it for and so if i'm encountering this object in real life if i have a picnic basket and i'm walking into a space and i see that that thing is a table i place my picnic basket there and i set aside a meal to eat if i'm somebody who does not have a home and i'm experiencing homelessness and i encounter that object that object is a home that object is a shelter if I'm cold and I have matches and I see that object, that's firewood. I'm going to chop that up and have a fire. And so that's the idea. Pragmatists will look at things and understand nothing is eternally, universally true. It depends on who is using it and for what. Well, then I guess the next question that pops in my head, and, and we ask this almost of, of every, uh, every philosophy of living we encounter, how does that not slide into relativism? I think that's a great question. And it's something a lot of people wrestle with, with pragmatism, because pragmatism, unlike a lot of other philosophical traditions, does not have an agreed upon principle, ideal or value that is universally always eternally going to be true. Pragmatism is kind of think of it as a catch all term that certain people and thinkers have embraced to de to describe or articulate their understanding of existence and experience. And so there are a lot of ideas that are connected to pragmatism, such as democracy, fallibilism, pluralism, free will. There's a whole host of things that are connected to pragmatism, but pragmatism itself does not have an inherent nature. And so there's not this thing that we can always stand on as a foundation. Pragmatism resists this notion of foundationalism. And so for a pragmatist, truths and ideas are, I suppose you could say there's a relativity to them, but I like the idea of them being relational. There's a relational aspect that a value doesn't exist in a vacuum. There isn't an unqualified good. There's not, no action we can take that is universally in all contexts good in and of itself. It's more of something is good depending on what it does for us. And so the way I look at the question of relativism is it's not as that much of a concern because I'm not trying to get at an absolute truth. I'm trying to cope with my environment. And so, and, th and this is a long way to get at your, your question, but I hopefully it offers some satisfying response. The pragmatists think of ideas and truth as helping us to cope with our environment. That's where you get back to Darwin, where Darwin talks about the species have evolved in the ways that whichever new characteristic helps them to better adapt to their environment, they survive. And that's how we kind of tend to view truth as a pragmatist is the ideas that help us to solve the problems we encounter. Those ideas have a quality of truth to them. 
And so I can't assert anything as absolutely universally always going to be true. In fact, most things I've believed or hold to have been wrong and many of them will be proven wrong in the future. And so it's about the relation. And again, like this table, there's not something that's objectively a table. I'm, I'm encountering an environment. And if I act as if that is a table because I have a picnic basket, that is true in that context and in that sense. I don't, I don't know if it was framed as this, but is William James is he thinking about pragmatism as a moral philosophy where, you know, you should use it to understand what decisions you should make, or is it just a way of understanding uh, the world around you? It can definitely be applied to help resolve moral quandaries. At first and foremost, it can be viewed as something a bit broader. It's a method. So, Charles Sanders Peirce, who came up with pragmatism, a lot of its ideas essentially saw pragmatism as a way to clarify our meaning. It was a way to a way to resolve metaphysical disputes. So going back to that, those earlier points about essence versus, you know, what is the essence of a table? Whereas a pragmatist looks at the practical consequences. That's what we mean by a table. And so that's for Peirce is what he's talking about of clarifying what we mean by words. And that's what for him pragmatism was William James comes along takes that and then he runs with it and establishes pragmatism not only as a way to clarify what we mean by what we say but as a theory of truth that truth is that which works and so at some point Charles Peirce is so bothered by William James's explanations of pragmatism that he calls it pragmaticism he calls it pragmaticism because he wants to use a term that he says is ugly enough to keep it safe from <laughs> kidnappers you know he calling william james a kidnapper of his philosophy and so and it evolves through the years right if you don't have an inherent nature what is pragmatism pragmatism means something to a lot of different people and that's the thing i want to highlight there are a lot of different pragmatisms you will have there are plenty of people who identify as pragmatists who will listen to some of my explanations and they will disagree vehemently, which is totally fine. There are a lot of different pragmatisms. And so for William James, he offers it up as a method that it can't pro it's not promising any end value or end result. It's just a way of getting us past places where we feel a bit stuck. And, and maybe, maybe I can start, going down this road about what William James talks about in his book, yeah. Pragmatism, which he calls a, a new way, a new name for some old ways of thinking. William James actually highlights a few different philosophers who I, he, historical philosophers who identifies as either being good pragmatists or at least being pragmatic at some point. He talks about Socrates and Aristotle and Hume. So in some ways he's saying pragmatism isn't really a, a new thing it's just being more clearly articulated now and that's what he's trying to do and so when he starts out talking about pragmatism it's less of about what to think and so for william james he talks about history uh, the history of philosophy being a clash of temperaments a lot of philosophers have this view that their explanation of the world is this view from nowhere that they're describing the objective facts. They're presenting the world as it is. Whereas William James is going to say, we are always viewing the world from somewhere. And that somewhere is ourselves and our own temperament. Our temperament informs the different principles and facts and ideas that we resonate with. And that's, that's part of why, economists may tend to see the world as data points because that's what satisfies them and their experience. A poet or an artist may see the world through feeling and certain visuals because that resonates with them. A minister might see God's hand all over the place because of their own experiences and they're going to be inclined to see things in a certain way. And so a pragmatist like William James is trying to acknowledge our temperaments inform a lot of how we articulate the way the world is there's the uh, a quote i believe it's accredited to rumi which is we see the world not as it is but as we are okay so so you mentioned all these different perspectives the uh, the artist the the priest as i understand 
the pragmatic notion of truth. Uh, last episode, we actually talked about Kierkegaard and his idea of subjective truth. Pragmatic truth is conditional? Yes, I would say there's a certain subjectivity to it. And again, it will depend on which pragmatist you lean on. Someone like William James and the classical pragmatists are focusing on the field of experience, and that's where we test things out. So it's subjective in the sense of we are individuals experiencing things. Charles Sanders Peirce talks about the, the community of inquirers, that in a free society, or an ideally maybe, but a freer society, all the inquiring minds who are trying to make sense of reality and are offering up their beliefs and viewpoints as to what reality is, they're contributing their viewpoints that no single individual has a totalizing view of reality. It, it's sort of, you can think of the that parable of you have a few men who are blind who are touching an elephant and they all describe the elephant differently because one is holding the tusk and others holding the trunk. Someone's holding the foot and they're all right, but they don't have a complete understanding of the elephant or of reality. And so a pragmatist in this community of inquirers we are all touching a different part or a different piece of reality. We have our hand on reality. We're not looking at it. We are holding and feeling and working through reality. And by having as many viewpoints at this table, we are going to have a better sense of how to interact with reality. William James says, truth is that which gets us into satisfactory relationships with experience. So for a pragmatist, they're not trying to draw a picture on the wall that says, oh, this is what reality looks like. They're saying these are the ideas and language that help us to cope with our experience. And sometimes our tools are better than others. And eventually we develop new tools because our situations evolve and adapt. And so they are always conditional. They're conditional upon the very specific context. We need to be humble about any views we have because we've been wrong about a lot of stuff. <laughs> Our views as science has rolled forward and scientific method, which is a very pragmatic method, a pragmatist would say, that we have to hold our understandings in a very approximate way. I guess I'll, I'll offer one more example of this that I think is really helpful for me of viewing it is the difference between the geocentric versus the heliocentric view of the world. And so going back several centuries, there is the view that the earth was at the center of the universe. And there were theologies built around this. There was science built around this. There were politics built around this. And from a pragmatic perspective, there was a lot of fruitful, productive things that came about from the geocentric worldview. You could actually navigate to a certain degree by the stars and all these things are possible. And so in a sense, there is a great quality of truth to that idea. However, when the heliocentric view comes about, we're able to do all that stuff and more, but better. And so that's the way I tend to view truth as whatever helps us to solve more problems as a community, that is going to be more true than whatever the alternative is. So it's not just what helps us solve problems in science, but what helps us solve problems in the moral realm in the religious realm, et cetera. Again, it's always conditional. It's always approximate. Hopefully we're being a bit humble about our views. Again, it's a method. It's an approach. Yeah, was, you got a question, Andrew? Sure. I was going to put you on the spot. Oh, good. You, can, you can put me <laughs> on ahead. the spot too. Okay, I will. <laughs> okay, Andrew, I don't think you've ever like come out and said, like, I'm an idealist, but I know that you're a great fan of Socrates and Plato. So, uh, so how's this... Um, this idea of pragmatic <laughs> truth sit with you? Sure. Um, I think I think I would describe myself probably mostly as a, an Aristotelian. I don't know. I think that, that this view is a little odd to me. I think w one of the things that I'm wondering about, uh, Jeffrey, that was going to be my next question. So maybe I'm doing a, a pump and dump scheme right now or something. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but... What are if we're all like kind of redefining our our truths and like in the end, what's it all for? I don't know if that really makes sense, but kind of like with your last example with the 
heliocentric. If, if yeah, at, at a point they were having incorrect views that were leading them, you know, there might be small truths inside of them that were leading up to this larger one. But at the end, it seems like this larger idea was just correct in general. I think it's a great question. It's definitely one we should all be wrestling with. And I think we most of us have been wrestling with is this teleology. What is, what is the telos for why we do anything? And this is where pragmatism has a lot of kinship with existentialism. It also has a lot of kinship with phenomenology, which is another European philosophy. And there isn't one single end goal. That's, for me, one of the big, one of the appealing things about pragmatism is it's pluralistic, that the end goal of existence is going to be different and many for each of us as human beings, that the good life can look a bit different for each of us. Their experience, I would say, reveals that there are certain ideas and ways of living that seem to be really helpful for living a good life, like having a shelter, having food at your table every day, having close friendships and loved ones. And we can go on this list of like, there's a handful of things that have proven across time to be pretty consistent. And a pragmatist is going to be okay with that, but acknowledging our view of what friendship means is going to be colored by our temperament. It's going to be colored by our own unique experiences. And while we may all be sitting around the dinner table looking at a dish that is, this is what friendship looks like, it's going to taste a little bit differently to each of us. And we each need different friendships. And so, again, it's plural. There are a lot of different ways. I think of maybe a different analogy of you maybe hear the term, there are many ways up the mountain. Um, going back to Charles Peirce's view on the community of inquirers, he has this notion of the, at the end of inquiry, which is basically, and this is Charles Peirce is one who, maybe someone who's maybe in your position, you may find more appealing because he has this more of a monistic view, this view of this unity of all things that eventually all people who are seeking truth and inquiring are going to eventually arrive at the same view. That's what Peirce argues. However, he says that end of inquiry is this always on the horizon viewpoint. It's kind of like you can keep dividing infinitely before you ever get to zero. You can never get to zero. And so that's how I view Charles Peirce's view is there are many ways up the mountain and it gets narrower as you get to the peak, mm. but you never quite get to the peak. Whereas someone like James, he was, I would say, a bit more pluralistic. We would say there are many ways up the many mountains, that there are many mountains that each of us are climbing. And so that's, again, the appeal for me is I've been so absolute about so many views in my life that have been wrong, that have been harmful, that have prevented my own growth or that of other people, that hopefully pragmatism can encourage me to be a, a little bit more humble about things. Uh, two, two questions I kind of want to talk about, and your academic versus practical approach may hit on this. Uh, I was kind of curious if there's like a difference between like someone who says, oh, I'm a very practical person uh, versus a pragmatist, like with a capital P and how that might inform, you know, the philosophy of pragmatism. Yeah, practical or being pragmatic. Pragmatic is a term you'll see thrown around in a lot of political discourse. Like if you just do a search of pragmatic and you're trying to do some philosophy, you'll just get a bunch of articles about politicians who are being pragmatic, which gets added a little bit. But that's, I think there can be a negative connotation of being pragmatic means you're just going to do whatever it takes to get what you want, which is has a truth to it in a very limited sense. There's much more to a pragmatist view than that. But the idea, the difference between those two is that when we become so dogmatic and absolute about any given principle or view that we have, that leads to some pretty disastrous results. That's why a lot of the pragmatists in the political sense tended to be very 
anti-imperialist, you know, very skeptical of American empire and state intervention into other communities. That's why pragmatists tend to be a bit more fluid about what is true because things change. That's where you have pragmatists who tend to be a bit more on the side of viewing gender and sexual orientation as being fluid and contextual. And there isn't this platonic form of what it means to be masculine or feminine. Pragmatists are going to understand those happen within historical moments. And so pragmatists are going to try and hold things tentatively, get into that question of being practical. There absolutely is that kinship there. But again, it's going to dig deeper into, oh, I'm someone who knows how to build a car engine or how to repair one, which is super practical. And it's super pragmatic because it's helping us to, in some ways, cope with our challenges of how do I get from one place to another? But then it extends beyond that because then you're wondering, well, how does my building a car engine relate to my relationship to the ecological environment? If I'm building car engines, I can get somewhere and that's great. But now I have to consider, well, what are the other practical consequences? If I'm driving a car, I am have emissions, I'm contributing to my carbon footprint, that's helping to contribute to climate change and all that stuff. And so if you're being a pragmatist, you're trying to understand how each of our actions connect to all the other aspects of our experiences. And so someone can be practical in a lot of ways, but you're trying to think about how it connects to all these other things and affects all other aspects of society and other people. Andrew, that might kind of address uh, your question earlier about morality. Yeah. So I think one of our common critiques on this podcast in general is like how we've seen academic philosophy presented is often quite scary and unapplicable to people's lives. And uh, we always uh, joke about the trolley car problem, uh, how just like un <laughs> unhelpful that just is in, in our lives and how philosophy seems often skewed towards these really abstract, unhelpful, unhelpful ways of just existing. So I think you kind of mentioned it earlier. Does pragmatism address this uh, or does James... Yeah, I, I I will resonate with that. I didn't enjoy a lot of my philosophy coursework as an undergrad because of this sort of abstract, sterile nature. And yeah, sure, trolley problems can be fun and you can get super wildly creative and philosophy Twitter loves to do them. <laughs> but when sure in is. real life has anyone ever encountered a trolley problem? Yeah. <laughs> so a pragmatist is going to be focused on what we actually encounter in our lives. And even the idea of trying to use trolley problems to come to ethical or moral principles, we have to hold those tentatively because we could encounter real life circumstances where a whole host of what we thought was absolutely true may not be ethically true. We, For example, you shouldn't kill people. Yeah, that's a pretty good moral principle. However, we can probably each of us think of an instance in which there could be a time in our life where it would be morally good to kill someone, maybe in war, defending your family, a whole host of things. And there are more advanced arguments that are still abstract that maybe accommodate that, but a pragmatist is focused on the practical. I think of in William James's book, Pragmatism, he actually speaks to a very specific example of a, he refers to a student who graduated from a Western university who would talk about how he, he had to leave behind the real world essentially to engage with the world of philosophers that exists in the philosophy classroom, which I think speaks to what you're talking about, where there just seems to be all these interesting questions, but a pragmatist would say a lot of these are the problems of philosophers. We need to be focused on the problems of people. Charles Peirce talks about this as well, and he says, let us not doubt in our philosophy, but we don't doubt in our hearts. And so I think of, for me, and maybe you've encountered this problem in philosophy of mind where, or the, you know, think of the matrix, right? We could just be brains in vats of goo that are having electrical impulses shot into them that are creating this reality that we're experiencing. And yeah, that's a mind blowing thought experiment, but that is a thought experiment. And there is nothing I can do about that thought experiment. I cannot prove or disprove it. However, 
given my experience and what I'm looking at practically, it's irrelevant. Like that's not going to give me any further help in addressing the problems we're encountering in our daily lives. And so that's why I try and hold Purse's view closely to not doubt in my philosophy what I don't doubt in my heart. Well, I can't agree more with that uh, with that particular standpoint. Jeffrey, you, you, you don't know this. We haven't talked about it, I don't think, on this podcast. We were originally going to call our podcast the Practical Philosophy Podcast. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so this is perhaps good that we're talking about pragmatism today because because we do say it all the time. We, we want what we talk about on this podcast to be helpful to people's lives. And, mm-hmm. uh, and I'll say something like that. And then, of course, Andrew will chime in and say like, yeah, instead of something like that stupid trolley car problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I want to, I'm questioning whether I've offered much by means of being practical and useful. So I want to offer maybe one concrete example from my own life in which pragmatism has helped me. And that is questions of differing viewpoints. Um, I come from a family with a variety of religious views. <laughs> to riff off of James. And although most of us were raised in a common faith tradition, a lot of us have veered onto our own paths and have a lot of us just have different views. And pragmatism has been incredibly practical and helpful for me. And we didn't talk about The Will to Believe, which is a very popular essay of James. So I'd recommend people go read that. But pragmatism has been helpful to me in that point because I'm reminded that I've had different experiences than my siblings. I've had not only been exposed to different books and articles and facts, but I have also had different experiences with those facts. I've had different religious experiences than them. And so rather than sit across from each other at a table and argue and bicker about the nature of God or the existence of God or any of that, we can discuss it and talk about our experiences. But because as James calls belief like belief in God, a live option or a lived hypothesis for a lot of people, I don't have an absolute view as to whether my belief or lack of belief in God is ultimately the most fruitful or the most helpful. I can only hold on to it and realize here are the religious views I have. They've been very helpful in carrying me through lots of other experiences in life, and they are fruitful in regards to my understanding of physics or science or politics, et cetera. But I could be wrong about a lot of those. And so hopefully when I'm interacting with my family members, I'm remaining humble about my viewpoint and understanding they have different experiences and their viewpoints are just as valid as another human at this table. And so that's just one example, which of course, as you might have guessed, came up for me a bit during my recent family visit. (laughs) So now we've come full circle. Well, there you go. I think that's an excellent example of of how pragmatism can be used in a person's life. Uh, And certainly in our our day and time here with our political discourse in our our country, it's probably advisable to hop off social media and talk with people and approach them with that same degree of humility. Okay, Jeffrey, thank you so much for uh, for helping us out understanding pragmatism and William James a bit more. It's time to go over to the quote corner, which uh, Jeffrey has so graciously said that he will join us in. So here we go. All right, everyone, welcome to the quote corner, a portion of our show where we take a quote from a philosopher and arbitrarily arbitrarily judge it on a scale of one to five stars. This week was my week, and I love soccer. I love football, um, which is what they call it in Europe. And summer is the time of tournaments. So the Euro Cup just ended, and the Copa America Cup, which is the South American tournament, just ended. And right now the Gold Cup which is the North American conference is playing. So lots of tournaments. So I thought I would choose a quote today that had something to do with soccer. This is our second quote and the quote corner has to do with sports, interestingly, and our second quote from Camus. So here it is. It's very short. Uh, The quote is all that I know most surely about morality and obligation. I owe to football, which of course is as we call it soccer here in the United States. So, uh, so that's Albert Camus. 
So there's the quote, guys. Uh, who wants to take a stab at this one first? Jeffrey, you should go first since you're the guest. I, I did watch bits and pieces of a couple of those matches. I'm not a an avid football follower. The pragmatist <laughs> part of me, yes. <laughs> as, uh, as uh, Walt Whitman says, I contain multitudes, and that's true for all of us. The, the pragmatist part of me would say, I appreciate the practical nature of that quote, that it really is in the very specific activities that we are able to make sense of any of our ideals and our principles and ethics. And as a athlete who has played soccer slash football, I understand that morality and social relationships play a big part of successful teams. And you see that in the concrete when you are playing the sport. So I will give that quote four and a half stars out of five. All right. Very good. Andrew, what do you think? You know, this this is really funny you chose this quote because after Italy won the Euro Cup, I was very excited. Um, and I, oh, I you were for Italy? Of course. I knew Come you would be from England. <laughs> and I was I was just uh, I was just about to race up, uh, get my phone and text you a uh, uh, ha um <laughs> haha text. But um I figured we'd talk about it on this podcast, so well, part of my family's Italian, so I had to go for them. So, sorry, Mr. Parsons. No, 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 um, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> I, I, uh, both of our last names are very endemic of our <laughs> cultural heritage. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't have anything as as philosophically um, interpretive of the quote as Jeffrey did. The The only part of the quote that, that bothers me is, is the all um, in front of it, is, is mm. the is the logic course taught me all is a very powerful word um, and, and very dangerous. So, so that's, that's a gripe um, that I have with it, but sports in general are hopeful and understanding morality and obligations to others, I think. And just because it's on a uh, theme of, of the, of the theme of the week, I, I'll give it a, a 4.5 as well. Oh man, this puts a lot of pressure on me. Um, so, so I've always heard this quote, and I've never bothered to to look up its source. And I didn't even this morning. I should have. I'm a very bad researcher. I, I'm hoping Camus is just having a good time talking with someone and making a, a funny quote about football. Um, I don't know that it really deeply informed his uh, moral outlook, but it might have. Who knows? I do believe he played football as, as a younger guy. But uh, I will. Um, boy. Let's see here. Andrew, I would have also uh, attacked the all if you had not. <laughs> I, I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> so. I, I appreciate the, the critique of the all as well. The, the, self, the pragmatist in the room will say, not always, because I, I think, of the, uh, think of the Star Wars quote from Obi-Wan Kenobi, who says, only the, only the Sith deal in absolutes, <laughs> which is kind of ironic. So I will, I will say there might be space for all or an absolute in some sense, but I think we should generally exercise caution around the word all. Agreed, agreed. Well, ah, gosh, I'm going to have to give it a 4.5 as well. I'd love to give Camus a 5. You know I love Camus. Uh, <laughs> but there we go, three uh, 4.5s. Man, unity. I guess, uh, I guess we all approach that in our own way, but arrived at the same the same mountaintop (laughs) (laughs) all right everybody that's about it for today thank you for spending your valuable time with us on this episode of open door philosophy we'd love it if you leave a positive review and hit that subscribe button wherever you listen to podcasts so you know when episodes drop and pass it on to all of your friends who could use a little pragmatism in their life we'd love to hear from you if you'd like to tell us what you think of the show have a question you'd like for us to discuss or a philosophy quote you'd like for us to rate, please email us at opendoorphilosophy at gmail.com. I'd say the email is the most practical way. <laughs> uh, you can follow all the philosophy on Twitter and Instagram and our website at Open Door Philosophy, where you can find many of the things we talk about on the show. We will put up resources uh, related to William James and pragmatism. All right. Once again, thank you to Jeffrey Howard for coming on this episode today. And thank you also to Kevin McLeod, who gives us our free music. And one more thanks to everybody who's listening. We'll see you next time. And remember, when your life seems in need of some philosophy, the door is always open.